Hello and welcome. I'm Sarah Napoli and I serve as the President and CEO of the San Diego Police Foundation and I'm your host today at America's Finest Canine Unit. As a matter of fact, you can probably see right behind me a training course and you'll actually see these athletic beautiful dogs going through this course a little later in our session today. But first of all, I want to tell you that it takes the support of our community and in particular the generosity of individuals and organizations in order to have this program available to you. So let's give a shout out to our anchor sponsors, Adriana and Cristiano Amon. I also want to thank our Catalyst sponsor, Qualcomm. And I also am very grateful for the support of Securitas USA San Diego. Barbie and Dan Spinozola, and I have a special treat because two of our sponsors are right here with us today from VCA Animal Hospitals. And that is Michelle Gonzalez and Villain Vlasov, and they're going to tell you what they love about the canine unit. I know he's a canine, but I still want to just like, yeah. give him a hug. <laughs> I was a hospital manager for seven years and saw the, the amount of work that went into the training and care of the animals. And it just makes us proud to continuously make sure that they have the best possible care, that there are funds available to make sure that there are canines to protect the city. Absolutely, the care of the uh, canine unit is very important to us. We're very proud um, that we have the privilege to care for them from toenail trims to complex surgeries um, and also including making sure that they are parasite free and we're extremely proud that we have the privilege to take care of them and keep them in good health. Seeing what the dogs go through, seeing the love and care that the officers provide to their dogs, it's their partner, just wants us to continue to help in any way we can. It's extremely near and dear to my heart also, because uh, my husband also is an officer, so it's uh, something that was really uh, prideful for me to be involved with and any chance I got to uh, you know, join a fundraiser or campaign or uh, do anything for outreach for the community, you can absolutely depend on us for that. Now we also, a little later in the program, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. So be sure you watch your chat box and type them in because we'll be answering as many questions as we can live right at the end of our program. And now we're going to have an opportunity to meet the stars of the show, our beloved police dogs. And we are going to see what they do day by day to prepare for their role with their handlers to keep San Diego safer. The K-9 unit started roughly about 35 years ago. It started in 1984, and it was established with 12 originally founding K-9 officers and handlers who came to our unit in response to a lot of officer-involved shootings, a lot of officer fatalities that were occurring in the early 80s, late 70s. So a use of force panel was established and determined that the K-9 would be one component uh, to be utilized as an officer safety tool out in the field to prevent officers from running down dark alleys or going into deep buildings where suspects were waiting for them. I grew up uh, around working dogs. My, my dad was the director of the Border Patrol's K-9. He ran that for over a decade, and uh, I grew up with uh, police dogs. I came to San Diego specifically because at the time it had the largest K-9 unit in the country, metropolitan-wise. I mean, in comparison to some of the larger cities, we're almost double some of the larger cities. K-9 is one of those units that you're drawn to, you're drawn to because of the dogs, you're drawn to because of the type of work that they do. We provide services to all of our uniform personnel out in the city. It's a centralized uniform position and they respond to all of our emergency or what we call hot calls around the city. They respond to any of our violent suspects with weapons, um, burglaries in progress, or any hot or emergency call that has the propensity for violence. They're utilized. And they're utilized as a less lethal force component to basically go over there and be the first component of de-escalation involved in this particular incident. 
As we know, over the last decade, the escalation has been one of the primary focuses in law enforcement around the country. Instead of officers immediately going to a higher force option, we now utilize the canine to try to bring things down, slow things down, and really respond as part of a crisis response team, as opposed to just going in there and grabbing somebody. So they will intervene on behalf of the officers. Oftentimes, the suspect will see the canine, and they'll, they want nothing to do with that dog. And ultimately, that's the best case scenario for us, is to show up just utilizing the psychological deterrent or the actual presence of a dog and get that compliance, and that's the perfect scenario. Our bite ratio is actually less than 0.01% of all of our contacts in the field, less than 25 times a year. So our bite ratio is extremely low in comparison to the number of times that dogs are not only deployed, but the number of calls that radio, of radio calls that officers actually go on. See behind us, you see the, it's, it's our canine memorial, and on here are some of our past canine handlers and our past canine uh, patrol dogs. It's an awesome part of our, our unit. It was, it was provided by our, the police foundation, and it, it's something nice that we can come out to, and it's, it's, a, it's a big showpiece when we have people come over. It's, 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 it's an awesome thing. We've had several officers, and we've had several canines who have been injured on duty, but in, in the 35 plus years that we've had, we've only had the one canine that's been killed in the line of duty. That's one too many, if you ask us obviously but but we've been very fortunate in the fact that these dogs are very resilient they're tough dogs and it's just part of the job for them they're they're incredible animals you may remember officer jonathan weiss from one of our previous videos in which we featured his relationship with ufo his now retired police dog officer weiss is on the training field today to guide us through some essential activities that the dogs and their officers perform daily here at the canine facility Okay, right now we have Officer Langley and his Belgian Malinois Ace. They're out here on our training field. Uh, they're gonna be doing some basic obedience. Uh, obedience is the, uh, the standard for all our training. We start all these dogs and all these handlers uh, with obedience. What that's doing is it's building the bond between the dog and the handler. Uh, the dogs are very much pack animals and they're always looking for directions. In this case, the handler is the pack leader for this dog. So what the dog is out here doing is not only is he learning from the handler and following the handler's instructions, he's having fun doing so. If you'll watch right now, the dog's in a down and what Langley's gonna now do, he's gonna do some basic obedience with the dog. The dog is doing it because he wants to please the handler. He wants to please his pack leader because he knows he gets rewarded for doing the right thing. In this case, the reward for this dog is playtime. Uh, all these handlers will do 15 minutes of obedience every day they work for an hour a week. Not only does it help build that bond between the handler and the dog, it also gives the dog a chance to get some exercise. It gives the handler a chance to check on the health of the dog, to check to make sure the dog's not limping, having breathing issues. As you can see, the dog is very attentive to the handler. Again, these dogs are working class dogs. They work, they want a job to do. His job right now is to please his handler, to make his handler happy. Happy. If you'll see now, Jason will take the dog up to the jumps because in the field, these dogs aren't going to do all their jobs out here on a nice grass field. They're going to do some of the stuff in attics, in parking lots, uh, at, at parks. So some of the stuff we have them do is going through things like tunnels, cramped spaces, up and over a wall, uh, different fences. If you don't know, dogs don't have the same three-dimensional vision that humans have. So when they come up against a chain link fence or they come up against a slatted fence, sometimes they're depth perception is not there. So we're teaching this dog that when the handler tells you to do something, trust your handler. He's not going to lead you astray. Same thing jumping through windows and confined spaces. This is going to transition later. Now when the handler needs the dog to jump through a car window, the dog's used to doing it. When the handler needs him to jump over obstacles in the field, they're going to do it. Um, and again, this dog is doing it because it wants to do it. There's two concepts of training. There is, uh, you see right now he's getting rewarded with a uh, Kong. So what he's doing, he's, he's, he's in what's called prey drive now. He's going out, he's catching that animal, that Kong, and he's bringing him back to his handler because that's what the handler wants. And he does it because the reward is now going to be he gets the Kong, the Kong thrown again for him. Out in the field, when, when we ask these dogs to go up against people a lot larger than them, they're going to trust their handler because of this scenario here, uh, the reward of the play. So if you notice, this uh, ace is a Belgian Mal. Well, right there was what Jason just did was what's called a call off. He sent him out to go get his toy, but the last second told him, no, hang on, come back. So that is one of the greatest tools that we have as, as canine handlers is the ability to recall our dog. 
as little as recall him off a toy that he's really excited to get, or we've sent him on a suspect, that suspect's now surrendered, and we want to stop the use of force. So unlike the other uses of force, to include you know a handgun, uh, bean bags, or even a taser, once those tools are, are put into use, you can no longer get those tools back. That is our number one thing, is we have the ability to recall. The other option is, too, is these dogs, we don't have to worry about aiming. Um, you know, once we, once we send them to do, no matter what the suspect's actions are, the dogs will adapt to them. So now on the field with me is uh, Officer Cassie and her dog, Valdo. Uh, if you notice, Valdo is another one of our Belgian Malinois. I'd say uh, the majority of our dogs are Belgian Malinois. And the reason for that is these dogs all come from mostly Europe or the sporting dog uh, countries. What we do is we purchase these dogs after they've done their uh, competition work. Uh, the San Diego Police Foundation has actually bought these dogs for us uh, for over the last almost 20 years at price tags of uh, just over $14,000. Uh, we wouldn't have a unit this size with this ability to, to do what we do without the San Diego Police Foundation. Uh, the reason the Belgian Mountain has kind of taken over uh, police work and sporting work is because of their athleticism, uh, their health, and then again the willingness to do the job. Remember, we're asking these dogs to do things solo. They're asking them to go after uh, subjects that are two to three times their size. A pack animal like this wouldn't normally instinctually do that. They would actually go out in a pack. Right now, Cassie's out here doing what's called a two toy uh, process. What she's doing is she's throwing one toy for the dog. When he brings it back, he re she rewards him with the second toy. So a lot of dogs, what they'll do is, okay, why will I run out and get that first toy when I know you're holding the second toy? So it's a lot of, again, obedience that the dog has to listen to what the handler wants. Don't think for yourself, do what I'm asking you to do because I might know something you don't know. Same thing goes for our agility. Cassie, if you want to take them up to the jumps, same thing goes with our agilities. You'll notice the Malinois are excited to do the jumps. They want to jump. They want to go through the tunnel. Versus you'll have a, a German Shepherd who's more of a thinking breed. Well, I'll go around the jump. I'll go around the tunnel because it's easier. So it, it tends to be a lot more of a uh, thinking man's game to teach these dogs to, to listen and do what they're told. I'm really enjoying being here at the canine unit today, and no matter how many times I come, I always learn something new. I imagine you're feeling the same way. Let's see what you're learning. I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions. On your screen, you'll see this question. How many canine teams are currently working with America's finest canine unit? Take your best guess. We'll have the answers for you at the end of the session, but meanwhile, I want to ask you another question. In the year 2020, how many calls did this canine unit respond to? Take your best guess. The answers are on the screen. Pick one. We'll have the answer for you at the end of the session. And now we're going to go back and see our canine unit in action. And the thing that amazes me is the bond between the handler and the police dog. Let's go see. Mitch Tani. I've been with the San Diego Police Department for eight years, uh, the canine unit for one, and uh, my dog's name is Hondo. My name is Ted Lorendo. I've been with the department 13 years, and specifically with canine, two years, and my police service dog's name is Robbie. My name is Javier Morales. I've been with the San Diego Police Department um, 12 and a half years, and on the canine unit about three and a half years. Uh, my dog is Titan. My name is Jason Langley. I've been on the police department for seven years, and I've been on the canine for a year. My dog's name is Ace. Always grew up with dogs, uh, and the, I don't think I've ever had a point in life where I didn't have at least one dog. I have four now, uh, including Hondo, so definitely, definitely an animal lover. You bond with your dogs at home. We spend just as much time with these dogs, um, 40, 50 hours a week in a car. Um, honestly, I probably see my work dog more than my personal dogs. We're with each other all day long. We eat together, eat in the car. He eats half my food. I don't eat half of his food. But, uh, you know, we hang out all day long. We play, we work, we train. Um, so it's a great bond. Hondo's the only one that uh, works for a living. The other rest of them are mooches, but uh, yeah, he's, he's fun. At, at home, they just like to rest. Uh, like, like me on weekends, you know, just kind of veg out at home and, uh, you know, eat and relax. Uh, that's pretty much the same dynamic for him. Robbie's high maintenance, so when it's the weekend, it's still work for me. I gotta pull him out like every hour. He's, uh, he'll let me know. He doesn't really bark too much. He has a more of a whine. Um, yeah. Sounds a little bit like, ah! 
like that. And I can hear it for it reverberates throughout the house and my wife will tell me, go get Robbie and yeah, it never stops. So what you're seeing here is a simulated pursuit. Oftentimes, uh, K9 will be one of the leads in any type of pursuit that we're involved in. And they're there, obviously, to mitigate risk and mitigate force that we utilize. So right now, we have this car set up. We have a, we have a suspect inside the car with the bite suit. And we're gonna try to get compliance verbally, but also utilizing the K9 as, as a psychological deterrent. In the vehicle, come on now, from the police dog. So our main goal here is to try to get compliance from this, this individual. We don't want to use force, um, we don't want to use the canine um, other than the psychological deterrent unless the actions of the suspect dictate that we do so. so the suspect is compliant right here. So this sort of training occurs, um, right now the post mandate is four hours a week, but we've nearly doubled it um, with our own our own type of reform, adding more training to really mitigate, mitigate risk to officers and, and suspects. So the suspect's gonna be taken into custody. However, we still have an issue with this car. We don't know who's in there. We don't know what sort of threat is in there. And then so we're gonna utilize this canine to go into the vehicle to ensure that there's nobody else in there that's gonna pose any problems or sa safety concerns for officers. So as you can see, it's really important for the dog to be able to come back. It's called a call off, or a, basically he's calling them back. So that's, that's, that's pretty important to have that, that verbal compliance from our dogs to be able to be called off whenever we tell them to. So in January, end of January, uh, we were on a standoff with a male um, who had put himself on top of a Connex box. Um, after about, I think it was four hours or so, he jumped down. Um, and started walking towards us armed with uh, what we could see as a razor blade and then his hand holding something wrapped in a piece of cloth. Uh, he was impacted with a bean bag uh, and then took off running. So fearing for the officers on the perimeter and the public that was around because it was in the Rosecrans area, lots of traffic, lots of people walking around, I sent my dog, um, Titan. Uh, unfortunately, as he spun around to face us the second time, Titan was airborne um, and he stabbed him in the stomach. Uh, he had a lacerated colon, uh, so we were able to take him into custody first. Uh, as soon as he was in handcuffs, I picked up Titan, we ran to my car, and uh, someone drove me to the VCA hospital. Um, obviously, he was bleeding profusely. Uh, he had three lacerations in his colon, uh, so immediately, we got lucky the surgeon happened to be there. Uh, so they took him into surgery immediately. I believe it was, I'd say five to six hour surgery, so we just stuck there waiting, waiting to hear. Uh, no updates in between, um, hoping for the best, and uh, he pulled through. Uh, we spent a week together. I spent my whole week at the hospital with him. Uh, they set up a little room for us, which is really nice. Um, since it's COVID, those rooms are empty, so they, I brought a cot over. One of the guys from the office brought a cot for me, and we spent the whole week there. And uh, came home the way next week, and he's, he's doing remarkably well. And was out training with us just yesterday, and uh, I mean, the dog, he's doing great. I don't think he's having any issues. We would never tell he was in an incident, minus the funky haircut he's got, <laughs> but besides that, he's doing, he's definitely putting in work, so. I know Officer Morales is very uh, humble about it, but um, himself and Titan are probably one of our best partnerships on this unit um, in regards to the strength of the pair, in regards to, the, to Titan's ability. Titan has been involved in a lot of apprehensions that have, I think, saved us from use, having to use lethal force in a situation where it would be permitted. Um, so we saved, ended up saving the suspect's life with the use of Titan and then with the skills and abilities of Officer Morales as well. So um, he won't tell you that, but it's, it's definitely known throughout the unit. training house we this is kind of it's it kind of emulates and more of like a two bedroom one bathroom apartment in like our mid-city area or uh, western division area and so what it does has an upstairs downstairs we have an attic for training we also have a crawl space for training 
We've also provided them with some environmental challenges such as stairs, slick surfaces, wood, high fines, low fines. So right now what you're seeing is you're seeing Hondo do what's called a, uh, a low fine. He's doing a crawl space search for his toy that's in there. So he's on odor in there. And this kind of just shows, this shows how, how our dogs are pretty versatile and going low, going high, and really just going into places that is very precarious areas for handlers to go into. So what we're going to see here is we're going to see Keenan and Hondo go into this building. He's going to do what's called a, a, just a quick cursory search using odor, using his nose to try to determine some sort of anomalies in there. Right now his ball is hidden in there as the odor that he's going to be indicating on. So sometimes officers will be called upon to search an attic. Um, suspects might run up there, but if we want to clear a house, the canine can utilize to really mitigate officer risk. So this is our, our traditional standard attic deployment. As you see Officer Tani has secured his PSP, his dog, to his shoulder. He's going to be going up and doing an attic deployment. Canine job is a very de physically demanding job. Um, you obviously take your work home with you. You figuratively and, and literally. Uh, but as you can see, these dogs are weighing. This guy's he looks little, but he's about 75 pounds of muscle. So right now we have a suicidal subject right here with a knife. He's been he's armed. Um, officers over here are basically they're they're coming in over here with a, what we call a crisis response team. They're going to be utilizing less lethal force options such as a beanbag as well as the canine as the primary contact um, officer. Chris, San Diego Police, bud. Need you to drop the knife or I'll send a police dog. You'll be bit. No, nah, man, it's too much. You need to I'm... drop it now. No, nah, I'm over it, man. I can't. Okay. can't do it. Tell me what's anymore. going on, bud. So as you can see, we have an uh, individual doing lethal cover. We have an individual doing doing what's called less lethal with the bean bag. And these are contingencies that are put in place in the event that the suspect's actions change from time to time. So this, this scenario will probably last upwards of 45 seconds right here, but this could go on for a long, long time because what, what officers and what we're trying to do as a police department is really mitigate our involvement as far as utilizing force. We don't want to use force. Officers don't want to use force. So if we can use verbal judo and really mitigate force by communicating and by having this basic this psychological deterrent with the canine that's the option that we want to go so as you can see the the officer is negotiating with the suspect trying to get him to surrender he's basically threatening him saying that he's going to be uh, he's going to send the dog in the event that the that the guy doesn't drop the knife or if he approaches officers Chris, uh, look like you're in the military can we get somebody to talk to you all right, there you go. All right. Perfect. Now do me a favor, turn around, face away from him, and get your hands up high. All right, man, I give up, dude. I'm sorry. As you can see, through the knife, he's given up. And ultimately, this is what we want. This is the, the perfect scenario for us. He's given up. He's compliant. And as you can see, the dog's barking at him, and that's kind of what we want. We want him to continue to think that there is a threat that the dog could potentially be used. The dog's only going to be used in the event that he tries to, to fight or attack officers or run. And that's the end of the perfect scenario. I hope you've enjoyed our time here at K9. I know I have. And I bet you're waiting to hear the answers to those questions. So I have them for you. You'll be amazed to hear that there are 36 teams that work with America's finest canine unit. If you pick that one, you're a winner. And then even more amazing, how many calls in 2020 did this unit respond to? That number is 21,541. That equates to two or three every single hour. So while we have been here together for a half an hour, our canine unit has responded to one or two calls, keeping San Diego safe. Safety and health are things that we tend to take for granted until they're threatened. This last year, all of us have felt that threat to our health and safety. And so I call upon you to, if you have it in your heart, support this Safety for All series. With your donations, we'll be able to share with the community what our police department actually does, how, and why. Here at the Canine Unit, you may be amazed to know that every single police dog that has worked with SDPD since 2003 has been purchased by community donations. So we welcome a gift of any size to support America's Finest Canine Unit and our Safety for All series. We're going to have a Q&A in a few moments live, so stay with us. But meanwhile, I want to thank our sponsors once again for helping bring this program to you.
Hello again. So glad to have you here for our live Q&A. And I'm going to introduce our very esteemed guests. We have the commander of America's finest canine unit, and that is Lieutenant Chris Tavenian. Good morning. Good morning. Great to have you here. Thank you. And then also someone that many of you have uh, come to know, you saw him on the video, and that is Officer Jonathan Weiss. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Great. Well, we have questions that we've pulled off of our chat. Some of you submitted them ahead of this session as well. And I'm going to read them from cue cards just right over there. So you'll see me cheating as I look at what people want to know. And the very first one is, what are the different types of canines and what are their functions? And Jonathan, I think you're going to take that one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on our unit, we have two different uh, units within our unit. You have the general purpose dogs, which are your patrol dogs. And we also have what's called the MOD dogs, the mobile odor detection dogs. Uh, these are the dogs that are out there looking for explosives. Uh, the breeds we use for the general service dogs are the Belgian Malinois. You saw a few of those in the video. Uh, German Shepherds, a lot of people are, are familiar with. And then the Dutch Shepherds. Then on the MOD side, you have anywhere from a Labrador, uh, Golden Retrievers, any kind of dog that really has a very big play drive and a good nose. And they have to be very social um, is what we use there. Terrific, thank you. Uh, we also want to know, one of our audience members asked, what qualities do you look for in a canine? Well, these canines, they're all raised, born raised in Europe and or Mexico or other countries where they're raised in sport or shits and work. And what we're really looking for is it's called aptitude. Does the dog have the willingness and ability to do the job? And also, are they athletic enough to do the job? These dogs, we like to call them, they're coming out of college uh, getting drafted into police or military service. So we're really, we go out and test these dogs. Um, we want to see their athletics, uh, their, their aptitude, their willingness to do the job. Because um, we ask them to do a lot more than a normal dog would want to do or, or even need to do. Um, so, so we're really looking for a lot of different things before we even purchase a dog. I get it. Now, um, I'd like to ask this question. Can you tell us a little bit more about the special collars that the dogs wear? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, these dogs are raised in Europe on different types of collars, but when we get them, mm -hmm. we put them on a restrictive collar. It's more for a safety reason, so the dogs can't slip loose, they can't pull loose. It's not just like your normal uh, nylon buckle collar. These are, these are high density metal, uh, so the dog can't get loose. Then they're slowly trained on what we call a stimulation collar, a tritronis collar. A lot of people mistake them as a shock collar. There's actually no electricity. It's a muscle stimulation and it's a training thing. We don't use it to punish the dog. We don't use it uh, for anything other than to train the dog a associated behavior to have while wearing the collar, uh, whether it be a directional, a recall, um, or whatnot. So you'll see some of these dogs have different types of metal collars and or you'll see the electronic stimulation <coughs> collars on them. Great, thank you for yeah. explaining that. Uh, so we'd like to know what qualifications make a good canine handler and how are both chosen to be part of this program? And I think, Lieutenant, that might be a good question for you. Sure, so the demands of a canine handler are, are very high. It's a stressful job, it's a physically demanding job. So the qualifications we're looking for in our officers that are in patrol are that they are experienced, that they can make good decisions under pressure and dynamic situations, and that they're physically fit. Those are the officers that we want to gravitate into our applicant pool. And from there, they go through a formal interview process, a firearms qualification that's specifically designed for our canine unit, and then a physical fitness test that includes carrying a 75 pound sandbag over your shoulder, going up and over obstacles to uh, mimic the dog in the situations they may be in. You get through all that, and they also have to have the support of the command that they come from. Um, once they get through all that, they start the uh, Canine Academy, and they don't all pass. It's a very challenging academy, mm -hmm. but uh, it's, the short answer is it takes a lot to be a canine handler. It takes a lot to get through the process, but once they do and we marry them up with that dog with the same amount of capability, we have a very powerful and useful tool to use in the field. That's exciting and amazing. The bar is very high. It is. <laughs> Good. Uh, so um, one of our audience members wonders, can civilian dogs get this training? Um, Yes, absolutely. Like I said, these dogs are raised in sport work, Shitsin, KVP. What I wouldn't recommend is the actual biting portion of, of these dogs. Uh, that's a liability that you should leave up to the experts. Um, locally, you can find different um, communities or training classes for the dogs. I highly recommend uh, learning basic obedience training for your dog and different sorts of, uh, of activities for your dog to participate in. 
on top of that, I always say that it's the handler or the owner that actually needs more training than the dog. Uh, so don't think you're going to send your dog away for a boot camp and get them home and they're going to they're going to be a one. Honestly, a lot more goes into the human factor than into the dog factor. Oh, that makes sense. So what prompted you to become a canine officer? Um, you know, I've been wanting to be a police officer since I was uh, pretty small. I grew up in an apartment, so we never owned a dog. Um, so I kind of married the two. I said, well, you know, I really want to be a police officer. I really want a dog. And so actually the foundation bought me my first dog I've ever owned in my entire life back in 2008. And so that was a, a pretty fun thing. And, you know, being a handler, you're expected to go citywide um, and you're going all what we call the hot call, the high risk calls, the pursuits. Um, the calls that you would say, oh, that's what police officers go to every day. That's what we do as canine handlers. Um, we're expected to go to all these calls. We're expected to take charge. And then again, my partner's a 90-pound uh, German Shepherd uh, that I get to spend 10 hours a day with. So it's a, it's a win-win, I believe. So what's uh, your dog's favorite toy? Uh, so my dog is Carson. He's an all-black German Shepherd from Slovakia. And right now, he really loves the, uh, the Kong ball. Those are really hard. I mean, it's amazing. If you try to squeeze it in your hands, you can't even bend the things. He, he grabs it and squeezes it like it's a tennis ball. Um, and he just loves it. And he, he's a little uh, monkey when I try to get it out of him. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, someone would like to know, how many canine handlers are on the canine unit? And um, how many of them are female? And Lieutenant, if you could take that one. Sure, so our unit is comprised of 36 working teams. Out of that 36 teams, four are specifically trained for bomb and bomb detection. We currently have one female officer, Officer Cassie Lorette. She's mm -hmm. an outstanding handler and one of our trainers. Uh, we've had female officers uh, be handlers in the past and we anticipate having more in the future as uh, the unit grows hopefully and as uh, positions become available. Okay. Uh, is each officer responsible for the cost of feeding and veterinary care for their canine? So during their time as uh, working dogs here with the city with their handler, the, the city does pay for their vet bills, feeding care, and their maintenance. Mm -hmm. Once the dogs are retired, they uh, sign a release of liability mm -hmm. with the handler and generally the handler will, ret will retain them and then they become responsible, they the handler, for taking care of the, the vet bills and food bills and things like that. Mm -hmm. So we at the foundation think of this as a public-private partnership. The dogs are purchased by the donors of the police foundation and then of course the city uh, handles all the rest of it. So uh, those two parts make a great whole for the canine unit. Uh, this is an interesting question. Why are bulletproof vests not used with our canines and has the canine unit considered it? Uh, yeah, actually, currently we are testing uh, two different types of bulletproof vests uh, for the dogs. For the years past, we haven't used them because our dogs are a very high drive and a very uh, energetic, uh, motivated dogs. And so what we're looking for is a dog is, has the ability to go out 30, 45 minutes and be able to search or do their job for an extended period of time like, an, like a professional athlete would. When you strap on a, a weight, of a vest, whether it be two or even three pounds, you're going to highly diminish that dog's ability to work. So they're going to they're going to be a lot slower. They're going to be get tired faster, and you're going to restrict their breathing. To counter that, uh, the Santa Police Department takes takes their risk into big control of where I won't try and send my dog uh, into a risk. I'll try and minimize that risk by using other tools. Um, and then I think. Um, I'll get into the next question a little bit, Sarah, if you don't mm -hmm. mind. Uh, I know they were asking about situations that it'd be dangerous to use a dog. And like I said, just strapping a vest on a dog and sending them in on an armed suspect, again, you're still not giving that dog the advantage and it's not very safe for the dog. Um, so we're gonna integrate with SWAT. Uh, we're gonna use robots and other techniques to give that dog the advantage. And yes, dogs have been stabbed uh, and, and they're very resilient and we're gonna try and take every effort to minimize that effect. Thank you, yeah. thank you. Um, so what is life like off the job with your canine? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's like any other dog out there. At home, they become a pet. In, in the beginning, you know, during their training phase, uh, you're kind of trying to learn their, their cues, their personalities, but once they've gotten the job and you've been working together for a while, um, they come home after 40 hours of work a week. They, they love to just lay around and sleep. Uh, they play on the yard with the other dogs or your family members. Um, they, they, they live a pretty good life at home, um, but most importantly, they, they want to go to work is what they want to do. But it's, uh, it's, it's just like having a big pet dog at home. 
Terrific. Now, Lieutenant, I know you are not currently uh, assigned a police dog, but uh, tell us about the dog in your life. Yeah, that's right. As Lieutenant of Senior PD K-9, uh, people think that you get a, a working dog like Officer Weiss. Uh, it's not the case, but what I do tell people is I, I have a dog. I guess you could call it my police dog. Uh, she's <laughs> a 20-pound poodle. Uh, her name is Maggie May. She is 13 years old and has one eye. And she was a package deal that came with my wife. Uh, and at home, Maggie May thinks she's a police canine, so that's about as close as I get to working with the dogs, but uh, it's good enough for me. <laughs> All in the family. Uh, what age are the dogs when you get them, and how many years do they work? Yeah, so when we look at purchasing a dog, we try and look around the 18-month to three-year range, um, and then we, the San Diego Police Department will now evaluate them at about eight years old. Um, that's about the, the the expectancy of the dog. Now some of the dogs have, the smaller dogs have really good health, really good abilities, and they could extend their working life a little bit longer. But about that eight years where we start to decide, you know, is their ability to do the job diminished and how's their quality of life? We don't want to work these dogs to death. We want them to be able to continue doing the job, wanting to do the job. And again, health is a big thing on the San Diego Police Department. Great. Uh, the next question, actually, I'm going to take because uh, one of our viewers is asking, how much does it cost to purchase a dog? Uh, the dogs are purchased by community donations. Ever since 2003, individuals and organizations like you have purchased uh, police canines to be trained and go to service with SDPD. And they come to us at $14,223. The next question is, uh, what happens when canines can't be properly trained? Uh, well, yeah, obviously at over a $14,000 price tag, uh, you know, that's a lot of money to spend on, on a, a piece of equipment that we're not sure it's going to work. Mm -hmm. um, so fortunately for us, our vendors have an agreement with us that they come with pretty much a one-year health and workability warranty. Uh, we'll get a dog, he'll pass all our tests. And then as we go through the academy proceed, if that dog just decides A, it doesn't want to do the job, or B, it's not meeting our standards, we can return the dog and then now return it for another dog. The good news is these vendors have police departments all over the country, including military and private security, that they try and match these dogs up for the department's needs. And we're looking for a certain breed and certain ability. This dog might not be good for us, but now it might go work for another department or a park ranger or some sort. So the good news is these dogs, although you know we get attached to them very fast, we do have a warranty, which is good for the foundation and, and the building of the bond between all these dogs and, and the community. Thank you. And actually, both of you gentlemen may, may want to answer this next question. How many dogs are there, and do you need any more? Um, yeah, so as uh, in the video, if you're paying attention to the one question, there are 36 current teams, four of the mod and 32 of the standard patrol. Um, and as of now, yes, we do want more dogs. Chief Nislite uh, wants to get us to where we have one dog per command, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that would demand 54 teams to cover the entire city 24 hours a day. Obviously, as uh, budget crisis and, and hiring goes, um, we have the ability with the foundation and the commitment of the community to get there. It's just now we need to get the whole police department built up. So as of now at 34, we're, we're at about average where the police department canine units have been. Um, but again, we want to get back up to that high number to provide the safety and the service to the citizens. Yeah, a bit more on that. The, uh, the mod dogs, as Officer Weiss referred to, are bomb dogs. They're designed to train bomb-making material, explosive devices, check on unattended packages. And what we're utilizing those for here in San Diego are for our large-scale events, our comic cons, rock and roll marathons, mm -hmm. other large-scale events with crowds to address the issues going on nationally, for example, like the Boston Marathon bombing and preventing that from here. That's what those dogs are designed to do. They're here in San Diego on a pilot program in conjunction with John Hopkins University and the Department of Homeland Security. Moving forward, as this program is demonstrating uh, success, it will be something that we will be looking for for support to continue to have that resource and keep these venues uh, safe here in San Diego. It's the only one in the country. Uh, we're finding a lot of success with it. People feel really good knowing they can go somewhere with their family and that there's been a, a sweep with uh, those dogs that have that capability. Well, we always say SDPD is a step ahead, not only in fighting crime, but also in accepting ascendant leadership practices in policing. So that is fantastic. I'm actually going to ask this now of Officer Weiss. Uh, do we have any female handlers at the canine unit? Um, yes. Uh, 
Lieutenant Darius, well, we do have one female handler. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other question we always get is, do we have any female dogs? Mm -hmm. And it's not for lack of ability, it's not, but we do not have any female dogs currently. Uh, we did have one several years ago, she's since retired. And everyone asks, well, well why are not the females? And I reply back to, uh, it's a business decision made by the vendors and the breeders in Europe. They tend to hold on to the females to continue having litters of puppies and more puppies they have, the more they can sell, so they try to keep the females. Uh, for health reasons or for whatever reasons, sometimes the females do get sold and we'll find their abilities just on par with the male counterparts. Uh, there's no difference, just whatever's available to us and if they're able to do the job, we'll take them. Oh, terrific. Okay. Uh, where do canines live during training, uh, service, and retirement? Uh, so the police dogs are assigned to a certain handler. That handler is given a kennel and a dog loo, mm -hmm. and they're expected to take that dog, and that dog lives with them at home. They're responsible for care for the dog, uh, health care, all the feeding, all the uh, grooming of the dog. So the city uh, pays for it, but the handler is the one that puts the time in to take mm -hmm. care of the dog. I see. Now, can people adopt a police canine after retirement? Not from the San Diego Police Department. First off, good luck getting uh, a retired dog away from its handler. Uh, I know uh, almost 100% of all our dogs and the handlers after spending six, that six years together, uh, nope, that's my dog. I'm, I'm going to hang on to him. Uh, however, if, even if, let's say, due to uh, residential living spaces or a conflict with other pets, if a handler can't take a dog, there's other handlers waiting for, for retired dogs, even retired handlers. So our department, you have to be a, a current or former handler to adopt a dog um, just because they're not out there. And then again, the liability, these dogs are trained with a special uh, skill. And uh, just for liability reasons, it's safer just to keep them with us. But again, like I said, good luck getting uh, my dog away from me when I retire. <laughs> That's a strong bond, unbreakable, <laughs> great. Uh, so I'm so glad one of our folks asked this question. How can community organizations help with funding and of course that's the role of the police foundation to ensure that our officers have what they need to do their jobs safely and with excellence and a big part of that of course are our wonderful police dogs and so uh, our viewers are invited to give a gift of any size is warmly welcomed at sdpolicefoundation.org and then of course the companion question is simply that how can community members help with the canine unit and then are there any volunteer opportunities, Lieutenant? Sure, well first of all, we'd, from the K-9 unit, we'd like to thank you, everybody out there in the public for the ongoing support that you've demonstrated over the years. I mean, you guys have done a lot for us already and with the foundation, <laughs> and we wouldn't be here without you. Uh, currently, what really helps us out is letting your elected officials know that you care about the K-9 unit, you recognize the value that it brings to the police department, interacting with us in events like this, seeing what we're all about, asking your questions, and hopefully us giving you answers so you have insight and a better understanding into what we do. And of course, supporting the foundation. Again, they buy all our dogs, they spend a lot of money to keep us up and running, and without them and, out your, and without your support, we would not have this unit. Terrific. Well, we've come to the end of our Q&A session today, and I want to again thank uh, Lieutenant Chris Tavanian for being thank here you. and for serving as our expert on scene, and also Officer Jonathan Weiss. We thank your unit for all that you do every day, and also the San Diego Police Department for allowing us to go inside and onto the training field with K-9. If those of you in the audience have enjoyed this, we hope that you will join us again for the next premiere. We're going to go to the crime lab. And this is always an interesting thing. You'll be surprised to learn it's a little different than what you see on TV. So join us for that session. We are premiering these uh, topics every fourth Wednesday. So see you on July 28th for that one at 11 o'clock. And uh, we would like you, if you would please, fill out our survey, just take you a few minutes and answer those several questions. It will help us make these programs even more interesting and impactful for people like you. And then of course, there will be more information on how you can get involved with what we're doing. So watch our website, sdpolicefoundation.org. And uh, we would like to thank our sponsors and everyone who's contributed to their efforts, whether it's time, talent, or treasure. We thank you for your support, and we look forward to seeing you at the next session of Safety for All.